Our Psalter reader this morning comes from Psalm 47 on God's rule over the nations. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God is king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Amen. Amen. A reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 11 on the ascension of Jesus. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Praise God. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in, the name, in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them, and he was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Over the course of time, humankind developed spoken and written languages to attempt to communicate with one another. Words, the foundation of how we communicate, often have multiple meanings that can be interpreted differently. And often, words can lose their true meaning in the translation from one language to another. Recognizing this opens the way to a clearer understanding of scripture. Take, for example, the word love. While we have only one word for love, the Greeks had several words with multiple meanings depending on the context of use. There is agape love, which most of you are familiar with, meaning the unconditional love of God or brotherly love as to will good to another. There is eros, the love of intimacy, also meaning an appreciation of beauty within that person or even becoming the appreciation of beauty itself. Eros can also be used to describe an intimate relationship that helps the soul recall knowledge of beauty, 
contributing to an understanding of spiritual truth. Philia, the affectionate love of friendship, brings with it meanings of loyalty to friends and family and community that requires virtue, equality, and familiarity. Sorge is the love and affection parents have for their children. It is also a natural empathy towards others, but it can still be used to reference one's love of country or a favorite sports team. Philoftia denotes self-love, to love oneself and to have regard for one's own happiness, which is a basic human necessity, often called self-compassion. But it also can be used to denote a moral flaw, such in the case of vanity or being selfish and self-obsessed. Finally, there is zinya, the concept of hospitality, seen as love in the form of generosity, gift exchange, and being reciprocal. And throughout the ancient world, hospitality was seen as a moral obligation. We know that all love and its many meanings stems from God's love. While we may think God has love for us and is of loving, God is the embodiment of perfect love. For God is love, as we're told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And how blessed we are that God loves us and that we are able to love because God first loved us. Yet while we love God, we often struggle to know God, to understand the depth and nature of God, which we mortal beings will never be able to fully comprehend. We are thankful for having the written word of God given to us through the Bible, which helps us to gain a better understanding of who God is and God's relationship with us. Yet many times when we read scripture, we lose the deeper meaning expressed within the original language composed, as well as the philosophic understanding of that period and its culture. Today, as we celebrate the ascension of the Lord, I'd like to share with you a short story I recently read. It was written by Reverend Donald Strobe, and this is an example of what I'm talking about. In a Roman Catholic parochial school, Sister Marie was teaching about the ascension of Jesus to her elementary school class. Fascinated by the story, one little boy asked, how fast was Jesus traveling when he ascended to, into the heavens? Startled at first, Sister Marie caught her breath and replied, well, let's see, uh, you know that he was not traveling faster than the speed of sound because the Bible says that he spoke words a blessing to the disciples as he parted from them. But this young boy, a child of the space age, quickly calculated and then came back saying, well, then in that case, he's not there yet. <laughs> Often, like this child, we try to understand scripture from our time and culture. And many want proof when something is sacred or a myth or a mystery. The truth of the Bible is that the language is not spatial, but spiritual, often understood through the language of metaphor and symbolism. Many people believe heaven is up and hell is down. This was the understanding of the universe of the people who lived in biblical times, and perhaps for those who still today believe that the earth is flat. And yes, there are some that do. The heaven, yet heaven and hell are not spatial, but they're spiritual places. This is not saying that they're not real, but they are not of this earthly realm for what is up and what is down when we know that the earth rotates each day and revolves around the sun each year. Those who take scripture literally miss the knowledge and the beauty, which contributes to an understanding of spiritual truth. So let's delve a little deeper into the ascension of the Lord. Have you ever pondered what took place or why this event was so important when it happened and even for us today? 
The Gospel of John 1, verse 1 through 3 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And verse 14 states, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. While we understand that this passage speaks to the incarnation, it has a deeper meaning that becomes of central importance on the ascension of our Lord, opening the way for us. The Greek word logos, translated to English, is the word. In hearing the word became flesh and lived among us, many people understand this to be reference to Jesus as the word. Yet Jesus of Nazareth was not present at creation. Rather, the Logos was present at creation. It is the Logos who became incarnate in Jesus, taking on the flesh and becoming fully human, as we are fully human, yet without sin. In looking at Jesus' relationship to God, we see the deep intimacy of love between them, Love that existed as the Logos in the beginning, which helps us understand Jesus telling us, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, in John 14, 10. And Jesus was truly a spirit person, one who knew the Holy Spirit, experienced the Spirit of God in possessing the wisdom of God, which he shared with his disciples. Jesus said, the words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own, but the Father who dwells within me does his work. Again, from John 14.10. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, are present in every divine act. And Jesus, being of human flesh, suffered, died, and was buried. He was raised on the third day and presented himself alive to the woman at the tomb, to his disciples, and according to 1 Corinthians 15, 6, to more than 500 others. In the 40 days following his resurrection, Jesus taught his disciples about the kingdom of God and opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Forty days after the resurrection, Jesus and his disciples went to Bethany, located on the southeast slopes of Mount Olivet, near Jerusalem. Here, just prior to his ascension, he promised them that they would soon receive the Holy Spirit. He promised they would receive power when the Holy Spirit had come upon them and that they would be witnesses to the ends of the earth. He blessed them and ascended, returning to heaven, disappearing into the clouds. The divinity of Christ's glory, which had been veiled during his time upon this earth, except at the transfiguration, was now revealed as they watched as he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy to wait for the Holy Spirit. The ascension of Christ marks his return of his heavenly glory. God the Father had lovingly sent the Logos incarnate in Jesus Christ who ministered upon the earth and who was now returning to the Father in his resurrection body, fully alive. This signaled the end of Christ's earthly ministry, marking the passing of Jesus' message and mission to his disciples, like passing a torch to light the way. All that was needed to be accomplished on earth was finished. As Jesus spoke his final words, it is finished, bowing his head and giving up his spirit. He defeated death by his resurrection and brings us to new life, eternal life. Fully alive in his resurrected body, Christ's human limitation is no more. 
His ascension into heaven allows him to prepare a place for us, as we are told in John 14, 2. And his new work as high priest and mediator of the new covenant began, as we are told in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16 and 9, 15. When Jesus comes again, he will return just as he left literally, bodily, and visibly in the clouds. This is in accordance with Acts 1.11, Daniel 7.13-14, Matthew 24.30, and Revelation 1.7. And while we wait for his return, we are reminded today that as disciples of Jesus Christ, baptized by the water and the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we too have received the same power as when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. And we too are called to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Christ told us, very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. What greater works is Jesus calling you to do, calling each of us to do? Jesus opened the way for us to receive the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is opening the way for us to share love and compassion through the power of the Holy Spirit. Understanding this, let us live into agape love by our willingness to do good and to help one another. May we share the love of Eros in an intimate relationship with God that helps our soul recall knowledge through the beauty of God's good creation that will contribute to the understanding of spiritual truth. May we share affectionate love of friendship in philia love and sorge love with our families while holding on to self-compassionate care and the love of Philadelphia, And let us love our neighbors as ourselves. And finally, let us embrace the concept of hospitality in the love of Xenia, which we make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, inviting others to come and know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 34 through 35. Amen. Our Lord, open the way for us. How can we open the way for others to know God? We do so by our love, by our care, by our compassion for others. And through our support in keeping this church ministry going. God was so generous in sending us Jesus. Jesus was so generous with us in all that he did for us. Let us be generous as God calls us to be.
Let us join in our hymn, The People Need the Lord, and it was given to you in a handout. I'll play it through once because I know you're not familiar with it. It's very pretty, and then we can come in. People truly need the Lord. So bring forth God's love and grace to all people. In the many forms of love that you heard today, share God's love and grace with one another and with all you meet, because people truly need to know the Lord. Go forth this day with God's blessings. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God's peace be with you all. <laughs> and for our postlude, Ellen has a special selection for us this day. Good morning. Um, I'll be playing a piece called May It Be, and it was recorded by Enya. And it was used for the Lord of the Rings, if you're ever familiar um, with the movies. It was recorded in 2001. And we're singing this in my Boston choir. 
which we have a concert on June 3rd at three o'clock in the afternoon in this beautiful Somerville Church. And uh, along with um, many, many pieces, the concert is called The Silver Screen. So it goes way back and comes right up to the current day of pieces that were on the screen. I'm gonna try to sing this. I'm not in very good voice today, but it's a beautiful piece. And there is some Gaelic in it. Uh, Morny A, O'Tuli A, which is Darkness Has Come. Morny A, Alanti A, which is Darkness Has Fallen, but the purpose of this piece is to bring light. Mark, do I shut this off? No. Thank you. 